Good morning and welcome to the Morning Scoop for Tuesday, January 25th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The Notre Dame game is in 221 days, the game against Michigan in 306 days. The past 24 months or so has been a tumultuous time in the history of college football, from the COVID pandemic to the loosening of transfer rules and the Alston case and the opening up of NIL opportunities. Things have been changing very quickly and seemingly all at once, and now even more changes could be on the way with the approval of a new NCAA constitution that could lay the groundwork for some significant changes in the sport. My guest today is Pete, uh, Peter Schoenthal. He is the CEO of Athliance, which calls itself an end-to-end NIL compliance solution. Peter, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. And I, I think I'd be remiss if I went on an Ohio State podcast and didn't start with a OH. <laughs> I think the audience knows the uh, knows the appropriate response to that. Uh, b- before we get to the NCAA Constitution, which I think is really fascinating, I think it's one of those things that uh, I, I, I think a lot of people have not heard about and don't really understand the significance of it. So I want to get to that a little bit. But I, obviously, you're an NIL guy. So let's talk a little bit about NIL and start with what your company, Athliance, actually does. Yeah. Well, first off, I really appreciate you calling me an NIL guy and not an NIL expert. <laughs> We are seven months into something that is brand new. I'm a big believer. You can't be an expert in something that's never existed before, which is college name, image, and likeness. And I think one of the issues with the space is you have a lot of people who are trying to further their brands, even from a legal standpoint, and are proclaiming and acting like experts, and they're not. And so I actually think a lot of the universities, a lot of the players um, are getting misguided and getting bad advice based on people who are acting like experts, but are really only trying to further themselves. So that actually brings us straight to Athliance. Athliance is an NIL software that we license to universities. So when student athletes at those universities get NIL deals, they can easily disclose the terms of those deals to their universities to make sure that the student athlete is not getting taken advantage of and make sure that they're also not violating NCAA, university, federal, and state rules, laws, and regulations so we can keep these student athletes safe. We also educate athletes through the app on life skills such as financial literacy, tax literacy, business formation, IP issues, um, you name it, we got it, even from how to, you know, what to look for in a mortgage rate, right? Stuff like that. So uh, my background was I used to coach youth football and I was a criminal defense attorney. So obviously we wanted to educate on tax purposes because that's what got me into this. I didn't want to represent kids for free on federal tax evasion charges. So uh, here we are. Yeah, we are, we are getting to uh, the, uh, the uh, tax time of year. So I wonder if people are going to be learning, a bunch of people are going to learn that lesson for the first time this year. Uh, listen, I, I think they will. We speak with schools all the time. One of the things I learned just today um, is that there was, um, I won't name the school, there were a few student athletes, and I, I, this might be a national issue, that don't want to disclose their deals because they think if they disclose it, they have to pay taxes. If they don't disclose it, they don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> and when I heard that this morning, my brain almost blew up. Um, and so obviously, that goes back to why we educate in the space. There are clear, there's clearly not enough education going on. Yeah, a bunch of people are going to hear, uh, learn, hear those numbers 1099 for the first time and go, wait, what? What? Yeah, this is uh, this it's is not a play call. It's not no, a play call, athletes. No. I promise you. <laughs> you know that NIL market has been really fascinating to watch play out because you know I think there are a lot of folks who have wanted to see these kind of opportunities open up for college athletes for years and years, and the folks in power kind of kept dragging their feet, and then it all kind of happened at once with states passing laws and the NCAA kind of at the very last minute just sort of waving the white flag. But that only happened right at the end of June. I mean, it seems like we've been talking about this for a long time, and that was what like less than seven months ago. Um, was that first season of NIL rights more or less active in terms of deals and the amount of money involved than you maybe expected when this all kind of first started? I think that question depends on who you're speaking with. So we as a company have been monitoring this and been in the space. We had been in the space about 20 months, 18 months before NIL started. So we knew it was happening no matter what. July 1st because of Florida. So my great state of Florida where I live um, announced legislation that they were starting NIL July 1st. And we knew the NCAA couldn't stop that because had they filed a lawsuit to stop Florida, they would have had to argue amateurism versus employment in front of the uh, Supreme Court. Um, And we knew they would never do that because the whole reason NIL became a thing is if you remember a few years ago, California said, hey, uh, in 2020, California said, hey, we're doing NIL starting 2024. And the NCAA said, over my dead body. 
And California said, great, we'll sue you in federal court and argue amateurism versus employment. And the NCAA said, okay, NIL for all. <laughs> so we knew it was starting July 1st. Now, July 1st w- made no sense. And that's why I made the joke of my great state of Florida. The launch date was actually always supposed to be August 1st. And the reason was, is the fiscal year of universities is not January 1st to December 31st. It's August 1 to July 31st, because that's technically when schools start. So you had schools clamoring, not knowing what to do, because they knew this was starting July 1st. The NCAA was trying to get its ducks in a row. But we knew one way or another, whether the NCAA gave us um, full-on legislation or not, this was happening. And so... Schools were not prepared for it. Athletes were not prepared for it. Brands were not prepared for it. But we knew the deals would start and start quickly because with a lack of legislation, people would come out of the woodworks trying to gain advantage for their university. So I would say the deals are about what we thought we'd see early on. What we're not seeing as much, which I think we'll see more, is Fortune 500 companies involved in the space. Because with a lack of legislation from a federal standpoint and multiple, multiple, multiple state legislations all over the place, big brands don't want to be the first one to get a kid in trouble. They're less, they're more risk averse. So we knew that they would uh, take a step back, which we do consulting work for some of them. And then student athletes, we knew were not educated on what they can and can't do. So they were kind of sitting back waiting. So like you're finally starting to hear about, which what we talked with kids about selling merch, Uh, camps, lessons, things of that nature. But we knew boosters would get involved. We knew local business would get involved. We knew certain uh, student athletes with high followers would be able to capitalize on their NIL. So um, the space has been the wild, wild west. Kids are doing pretty good on this. We knew that would happen right out the gate. But I would argue that student athletes aren't doing as well in the space uh, yet because they're not educated. I am of the belief, whether you're a division three, division two, or division one athlete, I don't care who you are. There's no reason why if you put a little effort in and get creative that you can make at least a thousand dollars a month on NIL. It's just these student athletes don't know what that safe, creative way is yet. And that's why we do a lot of education on that. You mentioned earlier, all the people who weren't quite prepared for this, like what, what kinds of issues have you seen come up so far in that NIL spell space, just because of the sort of kind of helter skelter or last minute nature that a lot of this stuff kind of happened on um, either on the players end of things or the schools. what kind of issues have you seen? What can, or what can't we do? I mean, the legislation is all over the place. So let's talk about it from a, it's a three prong, three prong discussion, right? First, the, the marketplace side, right? Bra- uh, brands, boosters, um, individuals, depending on where you are, that lack of legislation either scares you or gives you an in. Um, I knew when that University of Miami deal with Top Team America was announced that every booster in the country was licking their lips saying, oh, that's what I can do. Mm -hmm. Fortune 500 companies saying, wait a minute, there's legislation all over. We're risk averse. Let's let's wait and see. And then individuals looking for a way to help their favorite athlete or not. So um, they're still waiting to get educated. I think the, the, the national brands, as we get more clarity in the space, will get more involved. And I think as uh, governing bodies such as states, NCAA schools, and the federal government uh, get more involved and have more bite behind their bark, you'll see the boosters fall a little more in line. Uh, one of the things that we like to say is, is a crime a crime without a penalty? And that's kind of what we're seeing in the space right now. Um, from an athlete standpoint, it's they just don't know what they can and can't do from a creativity side. They all look at the space as like the Gatorades and the McDonald's. So like, what can I do where I would argue, I don't care where you are. It's a lot cheaper for a local business to use a college athlete with four or 5,000 followers to do a post, um, then pay for a billboard or pay for SEO, uh, camps, lessons, even reaching out for free meals. There's a lot of things you can do that they don't understand yet. So they don't understand the scope of NIL, um, lessons and camps. I may be, uh, a small fit, like I, I, I may be a backup offensive lineman at Ohio State that no one knows about, but when I go home, I'm the big man on campus so I can run a camp um, and make some money that way. I might be a tennis player at Ohio State, a female tennis player that I'm not getting my door you know, knocked down for NIL deals, but in the off season, there might be a 13-year-old girl in Columbus that wants a better serve and I can charge 150, 200 bucks an hour to help her out and make money that way. So it's, though, it's little things like that. 
Um, understanding that there's these third-party marketplaces that athletes can go to, like Icon Source, Dream Field, Market Price, where these kids can get uh, swag or even cash for for making uh, inter, uh, Instagram or Twitter posts. So student athletes learning creatively uh, from a creative side. They, they, so the kids know that right now as we figure out this space, there's no bite behind the bark. So schools are having a tough time enforcing the rules um, and then understanding what you can and can't do. And now you've got to worry about boosters getting involved in the space without legislation. Uh, I don't envy them at all. So I know that was a long-winded answer, but the space is all over the place in the Wild West, but it all depends on what lens you're looking f- from it on how that Wild West impacts you. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the, the student athletes doing lessons for kids. I mean, that sounds very theoretical, theoretical. I can tell you, I have a daughter who is a softball pitcher, whose coach is uh, a current D1 athlete who pay for lessons because this is someone who is young and can relate to kids that age and knows her stuff. And, you know, the, the results are right there. And, and it's like, you know, you know, and she thinks it's cool that she's working with a college pitcher. So listen, th- this space should be all roses. Like those mm-hmm. are the stories. That, that we love to talk about the philanthropic work, like Dylan Gibbons at Florida state, um, basically using his NIL to raise money, to bring a, um, s- someone with health issues down to a game. So, so they could watch their favorite player. It's about educating the athletes on that. The problem is right now, it's just the wild west and in any space, I don't even want to blame the NCAA for this in any space. When there's new legislation, people will look for loopholes and then we have to close those loopholes. That, that that's anything while we, well, well, from a legal term, right, we get precedent. So I don't blame that. But, but right now, especially after National Signing Day, the space has gone from, wow, this is great from athletes to this is getting a little out of control. What do we do? And I think we'll figure that out. Um, the NCAA, for all of their issues, I think one of the smart things they've done is sit back and let the space get out of control so they can say, see, you do need us a little bit. But I also don't know if that's their thinking. And my mother has a great phrase, don't rationalize irrational people. And we are talking about the NCAA. <laughs> yes, yes, we are talking about the NCAA. Sounds like we are on the same page with the NCAA there too. So that's uh, that's good. Um, you know, one thing that I think we talked about before we hit record, you know, the antitrust issues and like, the, you know, that's something that sort of gets talked about around the periphery of this conversation you think that could end up maybe leading to some issues for athletes down the line that, that antitrust things may not be, uh, that may not be something that they can lean on as much. Can you sort of explain what that might, you know, how that all kind of uh, figures together? Yeah, I I actually think uh, it's kind of the other way. The antitrust issues are being a little blown up, uh, blown Mm -hmm. out of proportion. Um, So let's start with the athletes as first of all, be careful what you wish for. Right. Um, if this becomes not uh, a student uh, university relationship and it becomes an employee employer relationship, um, say goodbye to antitrust, right? And, and, and protection from an antitrust issue and Alston. And I do think we're at further away than people think from an employment employee um, aspect for all athletes, because realistically, I don't think what people understand is you have football and basketball that drive money on the power five level, but most of these athletic departments run in the red. And how do you divvy up the money for swimming and tennis and other things like that? It, it's a much more complicated uh, um, breakdown, not to mention where do coach, like we, you, you know, when it, the, the argument for paying players, which I'm all for player compensation, um, talking about like they always use coaches. Look, coaches are making all this money, right? Look what Ryan Day is making at Ohio State. Mm-hmm. You got to understand where that money comes from. That money doesn't actually come from the athletic departments, that comes from boosters getting together to pay that salary when they want. Um, so the money isn't as big as some people think, but it, but it is big. Now let's talk about the NCAA and antitrust issues. And it all centers around Alston. So essentially Alston is a Supreme court case that just came out that basically allowed student athletes to get kind of extracurricular education, um, budgeting money. Right. But what came out of that, which people hang their hats on is there is an opinion that wasn't the majority opinion. It was a secondary opinion, um, which we call dicta from uh, Justice Kavanaugh. That was basically like, this is really, I, I don't like what the NCAA is doing here. This seems a little bit more employer employee. And so that scared the NCAA into putting in NIL legislation because they didn't want to punish student athletes because there could be antitrust issues there, right? So the antitrust issues that people talk about ha- happen to 
be between the NCAA and student athletes because the student athletes don't collectively bargain um, the rules that they follow. Now, the schools kind of do, right? There's no antitrust issue, in my opinion, between the NCAA and the schools because the schools sign the charter to follow the NCAA. And if you go with what Neil Gorsuch said, so Neil Gorsuch is the Supreme Court justice who wrote the opinion. He said, look, there's some things we got to figure out here, but let me tell you what the NCAA is. The NCAA is absolutely a governing body whose responsibility it, it is to make sure there's competitive balance. And there's a, they have the right to do that. It's just that their rules have to be reasonable. Okay. Right now, there are three rules from the NCAA, right? No inducement. There's got to be a quid pro quo and no pay for play. So if the NCAA finds that these schools are not enforcing those three rules um, and that there's a uh, lack of institutional control or that a student athlete breaks one of those three rules, I find it very difficult from an antitrust issue for someone to go in front of the uh, federal court and say, hey, uh, they shouldn't be able, the NCAA shouldn't be able to punish anyone. They're, they're overstepping because of antitrust. When I don't think anyone would read that three rules is overbearing and not reasonable. So that's what I mean by that. Now, I do think we get federal legislation from an NCAA, uh, from an NIL standpoint from Congress, and that's because of um, international students. International students make up 15% of co all college athletes, and they are here on an F-1 visa. Under their F-1 visa, they cannot participate in NIL. So if the, if the NCAA puts out more legislation, they still... It still doesn't apply to uh, international students because only the federal government has the ability to create a carve out with a visa restriction. And by the way, there is precedent for that with NHL and NBA players. So I know that was a really long winded uh, answer. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I probably created more questions than answers with it. But yeah, that's why. No, and, and the, the, you know, I mean, the international students is a whole separate side trail we could go down. But I mean, something you talked about in the middle there was you know, the restrictions on schools and the things that you can't do and the schools can't officially have anything to do with facilitating these deals. But I think people look at some of the numbers being thrown around right now. I'm just going to, everyone is, yeah, everyone right now is thinking Texas A&M. So I'm going to say the words Texas A&M's recruiting class out loud right now. No, no, th th this is good. This is way yeah, more yeah, fun than that. Yeah. That 10 minute yeah. legal answer. I just, yeah, made. they have, that has gotten a lot of attention. I mean, but there, I mean, there've been all sorts of, you know, all the, the Texas uh, offensive linemen all getting $50,000 deals. I mean, there's a bunch of these things that, you know, I, I think people are wondering, is this just going to kind of keep going up and up and up? Is this going to just going to, is this where the market's headed? Is this going to level off at some point when boosters yeah. see that the ROI isn't always there? Or is this just going to turn into just a perpetual arms with race with escalating uh, deals after year after year? Like, how do you see this thing going? I think it levels off uh, for a magnitude of reasons. One, I think we're going to, because of what we're seeing from these boosters taking it further and further and further to the point where you literally have Nick Saban and Kirby Smart at the national championship <laughs> game saying, we need more legislation. I want you to think about that. L less rules benefit who? The Georgias and the Alabamas mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. They're even saying we need more because they care about the sport. And they, they see where this is going. And I heard a great quote uh, today. Fattened pigs gets, get led to slaughter. That's what we're saying. People are pushing the envelope a little too much. Mm -hmm. And so I think we get legislation, more legislation because of we're creating a wider gap between the haves and the have nots. Um, and with more legislation that will also help uh, level out the playing field. I think the ROI is a, is a great, great point from a booster standpoint, not a brand standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. Brand Brands are always looking for people to further, but boosters, right? Are they going to want to keep spending that type of money year in and year out? Or is this kind of the new fun thing to do? Right. And, and where does that go? And then be the ROI. I mean, you see certain things like the Quinn ever situation at Ohio state, right? Where he got a large chunk of money to come. But clearly the rules state that you cannot and you can't give NIL deals with inducement. So what so you're in my opinion, you're never going to be able to have a contract that says, here's a million dollars. So long as you're at Ohio State, if you leave, you lose that deal. So what's going to protect these boosters when kids take the money and then they they transfer? Because you're not going to be able to work that into contracts. Um, and again, they're, they're, listen, there's always envelope pushing, there's always big spending when something is new, right? This is the new flashy toy. Um, but I think what's going to happen is over time, any space takes 24 to 48 months to figure itself out. There'll be a little bit less excitement. 
Um, and then also we're going to have the data. Once we have the data for what fair market value is and you know the return on investment and how this is actually impacting athletes and how it's actually impacting schools and recruiting classes and getting kids to stay, then within that framework, you'll see the playing field even out. And what I mean by even out is I don't necessarily think the money will stop. I think what will happen is, is it's a copycat league. Everyone will figure out what they can and can't do, what's the best approach. And then you'll see at the top 30 or 40 programs, you're going to be able to get the same NIL deals at Texas A&M that you get at Texas, that you get at Ohio State, that you get at Florida State, that you get at Miami, that you get at UCLA. It's not going to be that much different. It's just going to be, this is the, the ticket to entry. And so that's what I mean. I feel like we could do another hour and a half on NIL stuff, but I do want to touch on that NCAA constitution as well. That just passed late, uh, late last week in Indianapolis. You were in Indian, Indian in Indianapolis, according to your Twitter. I saw you. Uh, you I was, there. I was there. Uh, you know, this is not something that's going to immediately mean massive changes, but it feels like this is more like something that's like the step before the massive changes. Like it yep. sort of lays the groundwork for some big things that could be coming in the future. Can you actually just to start with explain what they actually voted on last week? Yeah, it's absolutely step one into revitalizing and shifting college athletics to fit a model um, that is represented in what we all think is going on in college athletics. So currently in college sports, you have D1, D2, and D3, okay? The way it's been structured forever is you have the NCAA body governing basically everyone under the same rules. What this did what was voted on is it basically acknowledges that division one is different than division two and division two is different than division three. And all of those divisions have the right to basically vote on and create the rules that they want for their individual selves, for the NCAA to employ and set governing over. So what that does is it creates different bodies of rules that allow the different divisions to work in different frameworks that benefit them. And I think the, really this impacts division one because division one is is, is is just something very different than division two and division three from a, from a financial model and revenue model and enforcement model. It's not going to fix everything because what we've seen, when, when we all watch college athletics, let's be honest, we're watching it from a division one lens. We all recognize very quickly that power five is different than group of five. And then taking a college basketball, right? FCS, when you in Division One football, you have about 128, 130 schools playing Division One football. You have about 300 schools playing Division One basketball. So there's even a bigger gap. And so I think the infighting is going to now start on Division One level, right, between the Power Fives and the not Power Fives. But I think this creates step one in the governance, especially as it pertains to NIL and the transfer portal, because NIL and transfer portal just impacts division one much more than it does division two and division three. So you have to have different rules and you have to have different approaches. And I think that's what we're going to see. All right. So that was the, you know, here's the facts, here's what happened. Now let's get fun. Let's do the fun thing. Let's get real speculative. What kind of things does this potentially open up as possibilities in the future on the D1 end of things? Like what kind of changes do you think this might set the table for? Are we talking about, I mean, you talked about the sort of infighting between the different levels, you know, is there potentially a split coming between the biggest schools and some of the smaller schools at some point? Like what, what, what do you think this leads to? Yeah, more fighting. Um, I was at the sports business journal conference, uh, a few weeks ago. And my biggest takeaway is, is that the power five commissioners don't get along and they can't agree on anything. <laughs> and that's not going to change. I think you have Greg Sankey at the sec who knows that he needs other division one. Like you can't just have 20 sec teams and break off and be your own league and, and keep the same power and money, but he's going to threaten that. And it's going to be a lot. I think the next two or three years are going to be a lot of politicking, a lot of grandstanding. I don't know how much gets done. Um, I think it's going to create more chaos to be quite honest with you in the short term, but in the, in the long term, I think you'll see division one athletics go more from more into the world of business and owning that and less from it's just amateurism. Right. Um, and, and then how that plays out will be very interesting. I do. I do caution against people thinking that we're closer to the employer employee employee employer relationship because of all of the student athletes. And we're not just talking football and basketball. I think the media loses sight of that quite a bit, right? When they talk college athletics, they are only talking power five football and basketball and college sports is much more than that, even on the division one level. Um, and so I think, I think it's going to be very interesting. 
and again, I feel like we could talk about this for about an hour and a half, two hours. That's a little longer than the show typically goes. So I guess we should probably wrap it up, but uh, we could do a part uh, two some other time. Buddy. <laughs> we, could, we could absolutely do it. Part two. There's, it feels like there's going to be no shortage of things to uh, talk about and everything's going to change in three weeks anyway. So uh, yeah, definitely have to have you back on, but until then let people know where they can find you on Twitter and where they can learn more about Athlines. Yeah, of course. You can learn more about Affliance at affliance.co. Uh, it is not a dot com. A, uh, a Chinese business over in China owns the dot com, and I do not negotiate with terrorists. Um, you can find me at on Twitter at nil Pete. You can find me on Instagram at the Human Attorney. Uh, you can find Affliance on Twitter and Instagram as well. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time and your insight on all this, and uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you, buddy. And thanks again to Peter for joining me. I have a feeling that will not be the last time you uh, see or hear from him. That was uh, a very, very enlightening conversation. And uh, I think I have a feeling that things are going to continue to change pretty significantly and pretty quickly on uh, a number of these fronts. So we're going to uh, going to have plenty more to talk about with him uh, at some point in, in the next uh, few weeks or months or so. So hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. I know sometimes these it's a little bit nitty gritty. It's a little bit technical, but this is the kind of stuff that it feels like it's important to sort of understand to really get the bigger picture with what's going on in college football and understand, you know, sort of the why behind a lot of the things that are happening right now in a lot of cases for the first time in college football history. So again, hope you guys enjoyed that show. You can uh, also make sure you enjoy all of our other great podcasts. They're on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, SoundCloud, Spricker, Spotify, you name it. They're all there. Uh, just search Buckeye scoop to find all of those. You can uh, subscribe right there to great shows like Buckeye weekly gives in the bank, big me kickoff around the oval and uh, you can also find them on YouTube. You can find that, go to youtube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. They're all there as well. And uh, subscribe right there, hit that bell, subscribe to our channel, and also hit thumbs up, hit that little thumbs up button on all of our videos that helps the algorithm show them to more folks. We do appreciate every little bit of help you can give us there. That uh, just kind of helps us grow our audience. It's a nice way, if you, uh, if you enjoy these shows, that'll help other folks uh, find, them, find them and enjoy them as well. So that'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.